Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Form Book. Some interesting racing coming up across Newbury and Warwick this weekend. It's Super Saturday at Newbury, which of course is headlined by the Betfair Hurdle. This is the Form Book, plenty to look forward to on this week's show. And joining me on this week's editions are Racing TV's Tom Thurgood and Dan Overall, friend of the show. Plenty when it's tipped up by Dan in the past. Hopefully he can fire again. But first up, Tom, how are you doing? Looking forward to a good weekend of racing action? Yeah, doing, doing well. Good to see you, uh, Danny. Good to see you, Dan. Um, yeah, looking forward to it this weekend. Um, interesting this morning, the field's taken a bit of a hit, especially at Warwick. Uh, but loads of good horses to look forward to at the weekend. And uh, yeah, look forward to getting stuck in. Dan, have you recovered from DRF yet? Uh, partially it's very much still on the comeback trail obviously now getting stuck into another weekend of racing has taken a bit of doing after the weekend we've just had but getting there slowly but surely the journey back on Monday may have been the longest and worst day of my life but I've survived <laughs> good stuff from Dan There's plenty of selections to come throughout the course of the show just before we get going give you a quick look at the racing tv website make sure you check this out for the latest tips news race cards results watch action and more there's a look at your news make sure you check that out plenty of tips on the website you can see dan's video tips uh, on there during the course of the next few weeks ross miller doing the business there today and remember you can watch all the racing in from uh, the racing tv website as well so do check it out www.racingtv.com for all of that Let's get straight into the action then. We'll start off at Newbury. First race we're going to look at there is the Denman at 2.05. Just the five runners here. Does he know Hitman Protector at Sam Brown and Shishkin? Well, of course, there's only one place to start, Dan. You, of course, tipped up Hewitt to win the King George at 12-1, to 1, but many people would have been very, very sore with that unseat for Shishkin at the second last. Would he have won? We'll take a look back at the race first, Dan. But first of all, your thoughts on his run in the Denman on Saturday. Now, Hewick always out in hand. I don't know what you're really referring to there. It was always a comfortable victory. Look, it was a very enigmatic situation. I guess Shishkin keeps finding new ways to be enigmatic. Obviously, he didn't go a yard in the Ryanair previously. He refused in the last time, and then he seemed to have the race wrapped up here and just stumbled a few yards after the fence. A really strange one. Obviously, the form of this race is probably up to question, given it was quite a lot slower and the Ile Francais was on the same card, and obviously Hewitt coming to, through to win with Alaho and Brave Man's game may be disappointing. Exactly what he's achieved in running to that level there, I'm not so sure. But what we do know, realistically speaking, is on, on all known ability and what he's shown previously, he does have the beating of Protector at. But there are questions that need to be answered. Obviously, the ground's going to be on the soft side, and it's his, his ground preference seems to change race by race, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't want ground definitely on the heavy side. He's been withdrawn on the past. I think this ground may just get away with it. The Gold Cup seems to be the ultimate aim as well. And there are still some question marks about what he still has and ha is continuing to achieve. But the betting really has shifted from the anti-post markets. He was 2-5 to five previously and Protector Up was 4-1. to one. See, now he's 8-11, to 11, Protector Up 2-1. to one. I think the shift has been too much now. I think on all-known ability, Shishkin beats Protector Up if running his race. And it's got to a point now in the market where I think Shishkin at eight to eleven is better value than Protector at is at two to one. Yeah, that's the latest movers from Betfair themselves. They're saying that there's been plenty of support in the last couple of days for Protector. What do you make of this race then, Tom? We'll go back to Shishkin, Shishkin's most recent win, which was in the Entry Bowl. Yeah, I think Dan has summed it up well. To be honest with you, um, on all, on all known form, uh, Shishkin should be winning this. I mean, just on the ratings, he's eight pounds clear of Protectorat and twenty one pounds clear um, of the rest. So the weight set up uh, really suits him. Uh, just with regard with regard to the ground, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I saw the latest update on the BHA website this morning. Um, how it's fresh ground since uh, their big handicap. So I think the ground should be okay for Shishkin um, on Saturday. Um, and yeah, I think Dan has summed it up well. Um, you'll certainly see worse chances, um, um, similarly priced, um, you know, given what he should theoretically uh, have in hand here. What about a quick word then, Dan, on on Protector? Of course, we've got to have a look at his Cheltenham third here recently. Then was a good second to long press in the Fleur de Lis. 
Yeah, obviously the Betfair chase was touted as main target early in the season. He was bitterly disappointing on that occasion. And maybe the yard form was the excuse for that. His run at Cheltenham was very much a back on track kind of run. He was held up, I think, just trying to get him sweet again. And I think he ran to a decent level here behind Broadway Boy. And then again at Lingfield behind Lompresse, where he seemed to be going really sweetly out in front, went well for a long way and just overhauled late by Lompresse, who, in my opinion, is the main Gold Cup hope for Britain going into Cheltenham this year. I still think on all peak form, he would have something to find with Pete Shishkin. But that long, that Lingfield run was encouraging. I think he'll run to a level. I'm just not sure that level would be good enough to be even, a, say, a, a 90% Shishkin. Just on the other couple of runners in the race, Tom, quick word on Hitman. Haven't seen him. Obviously, he entered the winner's enclosure for a long time. This is back in 2022. He's got an OK record at Newbury, but it looks, as you said, about the inferior ratings. He looks up against it against Shishkin. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he has been called some names in the past. We won't get into the the merits or the wise or wherefores of that right now. But um, it is just one win from 12 in senior company over fences. That was a graduation chase at Haydock a little while ago. Um, he recently had his fourth registered bout of wind surgery as well. So um, there are a few questions. I mean, he was a seven length second last year. Um, so, you know, he's entitled to have another go, but just with the inclusion of Shishkin and Protectorat. But it does look a stiffer contest this time around. And then the final couple of runners down, we've got Sam Brown and does he know? Just a quick word on those. Oh, Sam Brown, well, what a horse. Obviously, adding to his tally recently, winning the rearranged veterans final, 12 years old now, uh, pulled up in this last year. It's hard to really see him having much of a chance in the days. And does he know? Was he third in this year, last year? Uh, what's his previously won a November handicap in 2022 at Cheltenham? He was never really in it in the Florida de least. And I think maybe after some absences and time is just getting to him. And again, even on his absolute peak form, it's hard to see him beating Protector at Orchishin. So there's Sam Brown winning at Warwick. And of course, does he know? Got to go back to 2022 for the last win from that horse. So both the guys, are we, are we going with Shishkin, Tom, in here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, just to follow on what was mentioned about Sam Brown, um, he was the bigger priced outsider of the five when I last checked. I would give him probably the best squeak of somewhat outrunning his odds. He would probably prefer the ground a bit softer. Obviously, we're not wholly sure about the forecast yet and the chase course could get quite testing. And if it does, that will suit him. Um, but yeah, Shishkin is hard to overlook here. Um, but perhaps Sam Brown, the most likely candidate to um, outrun his odds. And Dan, are you in agreement? Yeah, especially now the market shifted so in Protectorat's favour. I think 8 to 11 about Shishkin is a decent price. So that's a look then at the Denman Chase. Next race that we're going to have a look at is indeed the game Spirit. Give you a quick graphic there with who's running. Amarillo Sky, Amarillo Sky Boot Hill, Calico, Editor De G, Edward Stone and Funambule Civila. And here's your betting at the moment. Edward Stone now favourite usurped Boot Hill, 13 to 8. Boot Hill at 15, 15 to 8, 13 to 2, Editor De G. 7 to 1 for Funambule uh, Civila, 12 to 1, Amarillo Sky and Calico. So that's a look then at the market. Come to you first on this occasion, Tom. We're going to have a look first at Boot Hill. Uh, he won the Wayward Lab back in 2022. Fell at Kempton last time out. What do you make of his chances here, Boot Hill? It's interesting, really. Yeah, um, I would probably side with Boot Hill in this race. I think when you're approaching this race, it's more about what your opinion on Ed Edward Stone is. Um, I guess we'll come on to him in more detail um, shortly. Um, but with regards to Boot Hill, it was disappointing at Kempton last time. Um, I think he is essentially a good jumper. It just looked a lapse of concentration to me. Uh, late down the back straight at Kempton, he just took off too early and... Um, I wouldn't be wholly concerned personally about that potentially about that potentially leaving a mark here. Sorry, um, I think this race setup could suit him quite well. Also, um, he's a bit of a free racer, um, and there is a bit of potential pace on here. So, um, yeah, hopefully this could set up quite nicely for him. Um, and just at the prices, he's a slightly bigger price than Edwardstone at the moment. I'd rather take a chance on Boot Hill. I think he's one of the few here who you could still call somewhat progressive. I think the others have reached their ceilings or have. Um, are sort of somewhat trying to recapture um, former glories to some degree. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll be fairly optimistic um, about Boot Hill, even, this, this, even if this does require a little bit more. OK, Boot Hill then for Tom. Let's have a look at Edward Stone. He, of course, pretty tame effort, you'd have to say, in the Sylvaniaco Conti. But he previously finished a good second on both occasions to John Bond in the Schlur and the Tingle Creek. Look at the Tingle Creek first here, Dan. What do you make, though, of Edward Stone's chances? 
I mean, you can't say the seconds to John Bon are disgraceful by any stretch of the imagination. He ran perfectly well there. But afterwards, he was a leading Ryanair contender for many uh, going out into the Silvagnaco Conti last time. And I think the hopes of that happening were over after about half half a mile. Like he just pulled his arm, the jockey's arms out for all that time, never settled and ran a really disappointing race. So this form behind John Bon would be good enough to win this race if he can repeat it. The issue is... Is he still going through his races? And now it's been a long time since he's gone through and won a race. Obviously, the 2022 Tingle Creek uh, was his last victory. And I just wonder after a couple of maybe hard races, especially that race uh, when he got beat by Editor Jeep, where he looked like he had it beat and then just didn't go through with it, whether he's still putting everything in at the back end. I think on his peak form, he'd win this. But I think there are question marks about him, although I would probably have him as the favourite over Boot Hill based on the peak form that he has achieved. Who do you like then, Dan? I would take a chance on Amarillo Sky here. I think this is a really trappy little race. As we haven't seen him since he was jarred up in the Clarence House and had a bit of touch of leg after that. But the plan has always kind of been to come here with a reappearance. And before that, he was upwardly progressive. So he was only beaten nine lengths uh, when we last saw him. And obviously he had excuses. He's two from two of offences at Newbury. I say the reading the stable tours early in the season, they always had this in mind as a potential starting point with a view to running in grade ones at the spring. So they clearly haven't lost any faith on him. And on the figures, he's only a pound off Boot Hill at the weights. I think it's one of those pretty trappy races where those at the top of the market have something to prove. Those are even short on him, I'd say, haven't really achieved all that much this season. I think if there's going to be one to spring a bit of a surprise at a prize, I think it's Amarillo Sky. OK, Amarillo Sky, an interesting contender then for Dan. Tom, just a brief word on a couple of the others. Maybe we'll start with uh, Funambule Sivilla, who's, of course, got a good record in the race. What did you make of his couple of last efforts? Yeah, um, yeah you're right. Um, he's searching for a free-timer in this um uh, his form, he hasn't been in quite as compelling form this year, has he? I think he's sort of rated £10 lower than he was this time last year. And um, the Venetia Williams yard, they had a notable winner at Ludlow the other day, didn't they, with a horse off a very long absence. But the yard has just been quiet enough, so um, that would be a slight concern for me. Um, just to go back to Amarillo Sky and what Dan was saying, I did have a quick record, um, a, a quick look at the record, sorry, of Joe Tizard in his 18 months or so of a license with horses after an absence. Admittedly, you are mostly looking at sort of class three, class four races at more provincial tracks, but the record isn't actually too bad. Um, the actual over expected would read positively. So um, perhaps a glimmer of hope there with regards to Amarillo Sky's chances in a, what is a trappy race, as Dan said. OK, I'm going to take a chance on Editor Deji. He's obviously going to make a very quick comeback. But of course, you can forget his run really last time in the Clarence House. He made that bad mistake at the third last. Previously done it nicely at Kempton when landing successive Desert Orchids. And I just think in a race where Edward Stone, despite the drop back in trip being in his favour, <clears throat> he clearly has a couple of question marks. Boot Hill is a fascinating runner, you have to say. Particularly on the ground, I wonder if it got even more testing, how much that would suit him. He was, of course, a non-runner on heavy ground when he was potentially going to lie up in the single creek on one occasion. But interesting race. Tom, what are you with? Amarillo Sky for Dan. Uh, yeah, so I am going to go with Boot Hill. Dan is right. This is trappy. Um, but yeah, I was looking at the head of the market and I just wanted to try and take on Edward Stone. And um, I'm willing to forgive Boot Hill's effort last time. I just thought it was a lapse of concentration and he's essentially a sound jumper and a quick jumper. So, um, yeah, this I wouldn't say this looks uh, a guilt opportunity necessary, but it looks a feasible, quite a presentable one um, to get um, a decent grade two victory in open company. OK, good stuff from the guys. That's a look at the first couple of races after this. We'll have a big look at the Betfair hurdle. <laughs> Twenty-five runners, so many I can't fit them on a graphic. So instead, I'll give you a bit of betting at the bottom of your screen. Nine to two favorite is O'Castle Demott, a Barico Lord at thirteen to two, eight to one for Alta Belly. Tell the name at ten to one under control. The same price. Twelves for Look Away and Brentford Hope. Lucia Lotus Hood, Spirit Denude, and Origny Mill all at fourteens, and it is sixteen to one bar. Now, of course, O'Castle Demott, we haven't actually seen run in Britain or Ireland yet for Willie Mullins. I think of a mark of 133 here, but I think the Irish handicapper gave a mark of 139. Dan, not expecting you to, you know, to tell me too much about this one, but it's a fascinating runner for Woody Mullins here at Castle de Mars. 
Well, no, it really is a strange situation. Obviously, the weights come out early for the Betfair hurdle. We hadn't seen him at all in Ireland yet, and he was entered at the DRF. And interestingly, this was a bit of a, a weird occurrence. He was initially given 133 over in Ireland as well, and then they reassessed him and put him on 139. So it's one of those unique situations where a horse is going to be running in Britain off a six pound lower mark than an Irish mark, which you could probably count on one hand or even maybe zero the amount of times that's happened in recent years. And if you're looking at that, literally, he's probably 10 but ten pounds better than he would be on average if he'd run in Ireland previously. Obviously, the form of what he's achieved in France is mixed. Some of it reads very well, but maybe it's a bit deceptive. He is a bit of an unknown quantity. Willie Mullins doesn't exactly have the best record in the race either. It has eluded him. So I think at the prices, and given there are a lot of decent horses near coming in form, and we know a bit more about the substance of their form, I think it's probably worth taking him on at the current prices. We're going to stick with you, Dan, and have a look at the Greatwood, Iberico Lord and Lookaway fighting out the finish here. Lucia, of course, also involved. What do you make of this race uh, in terms of its value for a Betfair Hurdle punter? Well, the race has worked out extremely well. So Iberico Lord, ironically, has probably been the one of these top, top six or seven to let it down slightly. But I think you can forgive his run last time out. I think he just wants softer ground. And obviously, it became good at Ascot. But it was looking very impressive this day. Look away. I'm still slightly sore. I never saw him on a handicap off his initial opening mark, 122. I had him down as a bit of a handicap rick coming into the season. Then he bolted up in a grade two and ruined that. And arguably, if he didn't run in that, he might have won the great wood. But there you go. I'm still not bitter, I, I promise. But I think look away is probably what the reliable one in this race or any race, we know the level of form he's going, to, he's going to achieve. He's just been very consistent. I think maybe he's vulnerable for win purposes. And you've got the likes of obviously Go Dante in there, who's achieved more and won one the next time out since. I mean, Lions run well, Lucia. Like it was a very, very good renewal of that race. Obviously, Iberico Lord, I'd say, with the ground getting softer, maybe with the standout here. I think when you saw that great with performance, you'd be hard pressed to believe he couldn't win off an eight pound higher mark than that. So, of those from that race, I'd give him the best chance. And maybe one we didn't see in that footage because he pulled up a quite a way out was Loda Sud. Now, he was scheduled to go novice chasing this season. I think all the early reports, he was doing that. But I think it was interesting when the Skeletons keep one back for these big two-mile handicaps. He was very well supported the night before the Great Wood, then very weak on the day. Travelled well to a point and stopped very quickly, given a break since. I think they kept him back with the idea that he is capable of winning one of these big races. I wouldn't completely give up on him, and it has been a bit of anti-post support for him. The way he travelled as a young horse when he came over from France in a couple of decent races was very encouraging. I think we'll like the soft ground. Obviously, he does have a bit to prove, but he's an outsider I wouldn't completely dismiss. Okay, interesting thoughts from Dan. A couple of other runners that we're going to mention include Orrigny Mill, Tom, and this is one that you're quite sweet on. Yeah, I've just been really taken with the manner of victory the last twice, really. Um, I mean, with regards to a Betfair herd, we wouldn't have the most compelling overall profile, perhaps, and off at big price in bump is a bit of a late developer. Uh, seemingly had some issues earlier on in his career, and they're only just getting um, a bit of a run with him now, the Victor Dartnell team. But uh, the manner of his last two victories have been really impressive. Look, ideally, you want a progressive horse for a big handicap like this, but he's not just stepping forward. He's taking chunks forward um, at the current time. Um, his Kempton win last time out, especially, um, I thought was really impressive. On his penultimate start, he won by five and a half lengths at Wing Canton. It honestly could have been 15 or 20 um, if the jockey so elected. Uh, he's a sensible rider, so he didn't. Um, but similarly at Kempton, um, he had the race won from really quite a way out. And um, I just think he's an interesting contender here. Um, look, the ground is a key variable in any horse race, but particularly here, um, we don't exactly know what the ground is going to be like. There is potential scope for it to be really quite deep and quite difficult ground. Um, I think with Aurigny Mill, the ground won't be a genuine concern either way, really. I'll be interested to see him on better ground, but I think if it's really testing ground, that will be fine. Um, he's a quick jumper, and I just think the setup of this race, um, there should be a bit of pace, principally with the likes of Lookaway and others. Um, if he can just travel at the back of the field, as he has done for his last two impressive wins, I just think this could set up quite nicely for him. And because he's trained by Victor, uh, Victor Dartnell, sorry, uh, you could perhaps argue that he, he could be a point or two overpriced in the betting just because uh, it's not the highest profile stable. But um, yeah, he's certainly an intriguing runner in this, I think. OK, good stuff from Tom. Dan, I know you've got a fancy in this, but first off, just a quick word on Alter Belly, because that's one that's been well backed in the market for Harry Fry. We've got to go a, a bit of a way back to his Carlisle win for the VT. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think Alter has been campaigned. I thought he was campaigned with that Ascot race last time out in mind. Obviously, he was a very big eye catcher on his seasonal reappearance. Uh, obviously, 
was a bit of an unknown quantity. Hadn't exactly been the most highly tried as a novice, unexposed in that regard. Shaped well behind Nick Abaka Glory. I think that set him up perfectly for a tilt at the Ascot race over Christmas, but didn't exactly deliver as maybe expected. And maybe the good ground on that account didn't convenience him. I think the softer ground will be in his favour. So he would not be without a chance. And I'm not surprised the money's come from him, again, given the weather forecast. And Harry Fry is, is pretty good at targeting these big two-mile handicaps as well. Well, an interesting jockey booking is Teller the name. Harry Cobden will take the ride for Ben Pauling. Ben has always held this horse in high regard. And Dan Overall is keen on the chances. Yeah, I think there's an awful lot to like about this horse. So the Ascot maiden hurdles worked out extremely well. Django by they both looked very smart horses that day. Then beat Lucky Place, who went is went very close behind Gidley Park at Cheltenham, now rated 137. I think that was an incredibly good run. I think you can forgive Aintree completely. Obviously, it was just too bad to be true. Right back on track this day at Huntingdon. Beat two decent start types very cozily. And he just oozes class, this horse. Ben Pauling's talked extremely highly of him, basically saying he could be the best he's ever trained. And he's not exactly shy about saying that. I guess the one concern with him is how the ground will be. And Ben Pauling has had a... A bit of a word of caution about this. If it isn't right, they may pull him out and they'll go straight to the Supreme. But if he does run, and given that the connections are already thinking the Supreme, regardless of here or if he runs here or not, I think tells you the regard in which he's held. He just looks a real speedy two-miler with so much class, still completely unexposed. His form stacks up, and I just think he's got an outstanding chance if he runs. OK, that's Dan's selection. I'm going to be with Spirit Danu, who represents Gary Moore here, purely on a ground basis, really. Gary's got an OK record in the race as well. But this was a good performance at Sandown. I was here this day. It was testing ground, but this horse stayed up very strongly to deliver the goods. He's got Quevin Quinn on board, who's had a fantastic time with things so far this season. And I just think at 14 to 1, he might be overpriced. Tell her the name is the one I probably respect most out of the rest of them. But a bit like Dan, I'm just a bit concerned about the ground for that one. But Spirit Danu, open to more improvement, will have to be off a mark of 139. But I think there could be a little bit more to come from Gary Moore's charge. Just a couple of others to quickly look at, Tom. Uh, have a quick look at Godanti and Doddy the Great. They, of course, clashed at Cheltenham. Interesting runner here for Ollie Murphy. And Doddy the Great remains an interesting prospect going forward for Seven Barrows. Yeah, I think Doddy the Great is perhaps um, more of a staying two-miler and has form at two and a half miles, doesn't he? So and we'll see how the race unravels on Saturday and what the ground might be like. I'll be perhaps keener on his chance if it was perhaps more of a, more of a stamina test um, at the trip. Um, Go Dante travelled well last time and he did well to win, didn't he, after somewhat bungling the final flight. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, though, if the form was reversed uh, between uh, um, Doddy the Great and uh, Go Dante um, in the Betfair hurdle on Saturday, um, in the expectation that it might be a bit more of a stamina test at the trip than that Cheltenham race that we've just seen was. And then finally, Dan, really mentioned, sorry, Seven Barrows have a couple of other runners, including under control. But Brentford Hope, Harry Durham was a guest on Luck on Sunday, talking up this horse's chances, formerly trained, of course, on the flat. Any thoughts on this win from Huntingdon? Well, he's, I think he's been aimed at a big handicap for a while. And obviously, he's shown plenty of ability on the flat and over hurdles, maybe in fits and starts. Obviously, seemingly very talented. And Harry Derham is proving to be an astute target trainer. I think maybe in a race like this, he may find one or two just a bit too good, a bit too professional. But you've got to respect him. He obviously still has a lot of ability. I don't think Harry Derham's got to the bottom of him. But maybe this race, in my opinion, might be a bit too deep for him. OK, let's look at the Betfair hurdle then. Dan is with Teller the name. <clears throat> or Rigney Mill for Tom. And I'm going to be with Spirit Danu. So that's a look at the feature. A couple more selections to come from Newbury straight off. <laughs> A couple of races have collapsed at Newbury later on, including this one. Not too many in this novice's limited handicap chase. Mr. Coffee, Inch House, Hometown Boy, Making Your Mind Up, Rock My Way and Hitching Jacking. We're just going to have a look at VT then here for Inch House, who I think probably is going to take a little bit of beating here. Tom, uh, got a good record at Newbury. Can't no longer show you those races, sadly. We're in 2024 now, but we can show you the Cheltenham second behind Stumptown. Dan and me were on the show last time. I think we both put up Inch House to beat Stumptown, who bounced back to form. The only concern I'd have is he didn't look the most game in a finish in terms of how he holds his head. 
Yeah, possibly. So maybe it's slight immaturity and greenness. He looks something of an unfurnished type still, doesn't he? Um, I don't think he jumped as well this day at Cheltenham than he did at Newbury. He was slightly scratchier and with his round of jumping. Um, but it is encouraging that he did jump well around Newbury on his penultimate start and, he, and, he, uh, and he's back here now. Um, I just think his form looks quite good and there's certainly leverage uh, from a mark of 137. Um, also, we're not wholly sure about the ground, but if it does deteriorate, he certainly looks more of a stare than not at this three mile trip um so i'm fairly relaxed um about the weather as well um yeah just with the, with the race somewhat collapsing as you said danny um this does look a good opportunity for inch house i think so that's tom's nap inch house but dan overall is, is not with us which is a concern dan who are you with <laughs> when it was the run last time out i think we did express those concerns one about maybe the ground two is genuine this and three maybe the undulating track at cheltenham i don't think suited so i think going back around newbury a track he's already had a, a decent level of form i think that's definitely a positive and as tom mentioned this race has cut up somewhat but i'm willing to give making your mind up a chance here obviously was a very decent novice herd the last season won a grade two in that sphere and i think given the shape of him and given connections i think he was always expected to make up into a better chaser hasn't necessarily transpired that way just yet ran pretty well on his chase debut at exeter finished fourth on that occasion the yards runners were generally in need of it at the start of the season and that race has worked out reasonably well with the third winning his next two you've got to forgive the disappointment at, Le at leicester when last seen behind apple away but we know what leicester can be like on heavy ground i mean it was really attritional stuff he jumped out to his left slightly so i think going back this way round will also help him and while the ground is maybe on the soft side it's gonna be nowhere near as attritional as it was at leicester i think he's still got scope to win races off of mark 131 and from what we've seen of his novice hurdling campaign he should remain better and paul nichols has won this race in 2021 and 2022 and it's a race he generally targets with a decent horse as well we're going to stick with dan because he also likes one in the bumper 425 union avenue yeah, just really uncomplicated horse. I mean, on this occasion, he's beat Farlander, Paul Nichols, who I think clearly has all the ability in the world, but you can see how awkward Farland was on the rear side, whereas Union Avenue, straight as an arrow, game to the line, pulled well clear of the rest. And that Farland was fourth in the Land Rover bumper to Predators Gold, who's obviously proven to be an extremely good horse for Willie Mullin. So I think this is, represents a high level of form. This race normally produces a good winner, and it normally comes from one of the more medium-sized yards, not one of the giants of the games like Nicky Henderson's or Paul Nichols. So I think maybe given the fact he's chained by James Moffat, he might go sl slightly under the radar, even though he's proven to be extremely effective in his two bumpers so far. I think that win in that bumper at we just saw is very solid level of form. He wants soft ground. Connections already are talking him up as a really interesting and good prospect for novice hurdles next season. And again, because I think he's maybe what represented by connections people wouldn't assume and associate with bumpers, he might be a pretty decent price as well. So Inch House in the 350 for Tom, 350 making your mind up for Dan, and also in the 425 at Newbury Union Avenue. We're going to fly through Warwick now, Kingmaker, just the three runners, Borbali, Matata and Pembroke. And this does really look, you'd have to say, judging by the betting and judging by the final field, four to nine, Jolly is Matata, Pembroke at three to one and Borbali at tens, a penalty kick for Matata. Is that how you saw it though, Tom Fergud? Uh, yeah, uh, an unoriginal response, but yeah, I'll be inclined to agree with you. Uh, just the one thing to note here potentially is the pace set up. Only three runners, but Ball Barley is something of um, of a died in the wall front runner, isn't he? And Matata certainly likes to go from the front. So um, I would assume Daryl Jacob won't do anything silly um, with regards to uh, you know getting involved in needless pace battles in a race that his mount um, you know should win. Um, but just perhaps a, something to note. But uh, yeah, this does look a something of a gilt-edged opportunity for the short price favourite, doesn't it? Same for you, Dan. Yeah, exactly that. I'd say while Ball Barley can go forward, I'm not sure he'll actually have the pace to go with Matata in the early stages because we just know he's such a king going two mile or out and out. Obviously, he's shown a consistently high level of form this season. Conditions will suit, the track will suit. Yeah, hard to really look past him, in my opinion. This is a look at Ball Barley winning that match race uh, that, he, that he beat the favourite first three at one to seven. He's the outsider of the lot, looks up against it, but a good performance nonetheless to win on this day. But the other one is Pembroke. Of course, we saw him last time out winning a match race. Dan, uh, sorry, winning. He's won a couple of small fields, hasn't he? One fell and then he finished alone at entry, which is this VT we're showing you here. Do you give him much chance of serving it up, though, to Matata? Well, he's got a bit to find with what we saw from the Lingfield race as well. Obviously, he uh, seems to relish testing conditions. I mean, the fact that he was the only one to finish with a four-runner field, I think, it tells its own story. I think whether he's really got enough in hand to close up the gap on Matata. I mean, obviously, I think that he's better off at the weights here than he was 
Act. Oh, no, I think it's actually, no, it might be still off the same terms, which again is going to count against him. And just the way this race was set up, I think it's hard to really see Pembroke overturning that gap against Matata. Next up is the Warwick Mayor's Hurdle. Four runners in this. Blue Beach, get a tonic, win to the lightning, and you wear it well. Latest betting that we have for this race has the one to two favourite being you wear it well, ahead of win to the lightning, uh, four to one, along with get a tonic and Blue Beach. We've got plenty of these recent form of you wear it well. Tom, come to you first. This was the win over Lucia at Weatherby. Uh, yeah, no, this was a decent performance um, on the day, I think. Um, yeah, she's an interesting one here, isn't she? Um, I think she's odds on at the moment, uh, certainly favoured by the weight structure of this race, uh, quite a bit clear in official ratings, and I mean, as advantage by the weight set up here. So um looks a good opportunity. Um, I imagine, I'm not wholly sure what the riding tactics will be. She generally goes on the front, doesn't she? But um, she's not necessarily a dyed in the wall front runner. There is one other horse in this race, um, no, no tonic, I think, in the forerunner field who likes to go from the front. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens there. But, um, yeah, similarly to the last race, a bit more competitive this one, but this looks a good opportunity uh, for you wear it well and um, likely to feature in a few accumulators, I'll suspect, on Saturday up and down the land. Dan, overall, though, it's having a go at taking on the favourite. Give me your thoughts, Dan. Yeah, I, I've res you've got to respect you right well. She's the form standard, ran really well last time out with a change of tactics over three miles on good ground wasn't ideal. I think maybe the form of that is somewhat up to question. I'm not sure Marie's Rock is the horse she was. Obviously, Tweed Skirt was not too far away, and she was a pretty average hurdler before thriving over fences. So I'm not sure the form of that is all up to scratch. I think Winds of the Lightning, in, in this sense, you've got a really improving mare. And in recent winners of this race have been improving mares in handicap company, have managed to make the step up in this race previously. So I don't think she's a four lawn hope by any stretch of the imagination i see this win at weatherby i think was really impressive uh, she went up 12 pounds for this win but handled conditions really well see flat track two and a half miles so we know the conditions of this race should suit and off the 12 pound higher mark i thought she ran a really good race at cheltenham that race has worked out extremely well with nurse susan winning again next time out good luck charm was there who's been admirably consistent in good races i love the nightlife one next time out and she's just a very likeable game mare who's still far from exposed. And while she does have eight pounds to find uh, with you at where on the weight adjusted ratings, she could just benefit as well from if there is a pace clash up front with you where it well and get a tonic. She could be the one, the one to capitalize because I think she'll be a very strong stare at two and a half miles. And at four to one versus one to two, I just prefer to side with her at the prices. Final race we're going to have a look at then at Warwick is a veterans handicap chase. Diego de Charmy, good to see him back. Do your job, leather, Gary, and Broken Quest. Riders on the story. Storm, Champagne Mystery, and Fast Buck. In terms of how they bet, five to two favorite, do your job. Seven to two riders on the Storm, 100 to 30 for Fast Buck. Diego de Charmy at nine to two. Le Ligarian at 13 to two. 14 to one for Champagne Mystery. And your double carpet selection is Broken Quest. Well, Tom has a fancy in this contest, so I'll come to him to explain. All right, well, willing to take a chance on one at a price, we'll see. Shame only seven runners, um, consequences there for each way um, betting. Um, but yeah, I thought Champagne Mystery was interesting here um, on his latest run um, at the last Cheltenham meeting in a decent handicap behind some good horses, the likes of Garlaw and Il Redotto. Um, wasn't given an efficient ride, I think it's fair enough to say, and was was well detached in the early stages, uh, jumped well, um, which I which I thought was noteworthy, especially in this field. A few of these do have some question marks with regards to their jumping, and Warwick, as we know, does take a bit of jumping. Uh, but presumably the French-based jockey who does retain the ride here uh, made quite a big move from right of the back of the field at Cheltenham, coming really wide down the hill and was almost upsides and in the lead, uh, jumping the third last. Uh, the horse uh, perhaps understandably got tired. He went off at a big price at Cheltenham and wasn't particularly well fancied anyway, uh, but stuck on for fifth. I just think uh, at a big price, I think he's 16 to 1 at the moment. Uh, first time out in veterans company. Um, he could just perhaps have a little bit more to offer uh, with that recent effort behind him. Uh, with the caveat, as I say, that this does come fairly soon after that Cheltenham run. Uh, but I just thought he was interesting at the price. And um, yeah, happy to take a little swing here and see how we go. OK, that's the three o'clock at work then, Champagne Mystery. Dan, you like one on the card. Uh, give us your thoughts on that one. 
Yeah, so going to the 405 at Warwick, the two-mile handicap, and I think into the park is a really progressively upwardly mobile two-mile hurdler. I mean, he's been given a supreme entry, which I think shows you the regard in which he was held. Obviously, the Philip Hobbs, Johnson White team are also going for a really good run of form. Won easily last time out at Newbury, but even before that, he had a lot of solid form to his name. He was close up in a point appointment falling, and Jasmine DeVoe won that, and now he's now champion bumper favourite. The second's rate 127 with Paul Nichols. And this day, he ran a really good race behind a horse of Nicky Henderson and a horse of Paul Nichols. I think you can probably say that's going to be a high level of form. The next first two haven't been tested since, but this was a really promising effort. And he's just one that's been building up gradually. I think there's still a fair bit more to come from him off a mark 120. As I mentioned earlier, the fact they even entered him as Supreme shows you the regard in which he's held. So I think on his handicap debut, he could take a lot of beating here. Dan's nap then of the weekend is the 405 Warwick into the park. And that race, as Dan says, does look an interesting one. Joyeuse did it nicely for seven barrows on that occasion. Tom, your nap of the weekend is? Yeah, it is going to be Inch House, as discussed earlier. Um, yeah, with that field cutting up, um, I think he has leverage of a mark of 137. Um, a nice chaser going back to Newbury is a positive. And just with the race cutting up, yeah, I think it looks a good opportunity for him on Saturday. OK, and I'm also in agreement with Tom, going to give Inch House one more chance here. I think has got a good uh, good chance of going close in that contest at Newbury. So there you go. That's all the action previewed across Newbury and Warwick. Plenty of interesting selections, big price ones at that from both Dan and Tom. Thanks very much for watching. Remember, you can watch all the action from Warwick live on Racing TV, Sky Channel 424. Watch it all this weekend. Plenty to, of course, enjoy on the website. And do check out our YouTube channel and our other socials as well. Thanks very much to Tom and to Dan. They'll both be back on the form book soon. And I hope you've enjoyed this week's show. Please leave us a comment, like, and subscribe to Racing TV on YouTube. But for me, thanks very much for joining us. And do remember to please gamble responsibly. Thank you.